At that very time, Jesus rejoiced greatly in the Holy Spirit and said, I praise thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou didst hide these things from the wise and intelligent and didst reveal them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in thy sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father and who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Jesus rejoiced greatly when he considered that the names of these seventy whom he had sent out was recorded in heaven, as we read in verse 20. While the seventy returned rejoicing that demons were subject to them in the name of Jesus, Jesus told in verse 20, don't rejoice in this, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. And that's the thing that brought joy to Jesus, we read in verse 21. He rejoiced greatly that these wonderful truths of the Spirit had been revealed to babes, to those who were not learned or educated, for these 70 were not priests or scribes. They were ordinary lay people. Those are the ones Jesus picked up. In fact, all of Jesus' apostles and disciples were lay people. They were not Bible scholars or Bible college students or priests or any such thing. They were ordinary working men whom Jesus picked up and made into prophets and apostles. And he rejoiced greatly that Almighty God, his Father, had chosen to hide all these wonderful truths from the great scholars of his time and had chosen to reveal them to those whom the world considered unlearned and ignorant babes. And Jesus said, Father, it wasn't just a statement of fact. He said he rejoiced in it. He was really delighted that God had chosen to do it like that. Yes, Father, for thus it was well pleasing in thy sight. It pleased the Father to choose such people. And even today, it's the same. God chooses those who are not learned and educated and accepted in the eyes of the world or even in Christian circles. Those who are simple, ordinary people, he anoints with the Holy Spirit's power and makes them his prophets and his apostles. And we need to rejoice in that too, just like Jesus did. And then he went on to say in verse 22, All things have been handed over to me by my Father. Everything that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. Was that partiality? No, it was not. We read in John and chapter 17 that there was a reason for this. In John 17 we read in verse 10, Jesus saying, all things that are mine are thine, he says to the Father. And that is the reason why all things that were thine are mine. Everything that Jesus had belonged to the Father. He had given it up voluntarily. He gave it all up to the Father. And therefore, the Father gave everything he had to Jesus. It was a, a fair exchange. And the way Jesus went is the way that we can go too, for he calls us to follow him. There I am, there shall also my servant be, he says. If any man will follow me, let him take up his cross and follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be. Everything that the Father did for him, he will do for us. The condition is the same. We have to give everything to Jesus. And then he gives everything to us. The measure in which we receive the authority and the power of the Lord in our life is dependent on the measure in which we give ourselves completely everything that we are, all that we have, to him. And that was the reason why we read in Luke 10, 22, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. The Father could entrust Jesus with everything. He knew that Jesus wouldn't take that glory to himself, but would give it back to the Father. Very often he cannot entrust much to us because we take the glory, the honor, the credit to ourselves. 
And then he went on to say, no one knows who the Son is except the Father. We cannot know Jesus by intellectual study. You remember when Peter said concerning Jesus, we saw that in the previous chapter, Luke chapter 9. Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, your human cleverness has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven, to know Jesus as a person, to study about him in the Bible, you don't need the revelation of the Holy Spirit. All you need is a good brain. But if you want to know Jesus in the Spirit, then we need the Spirit of wisdom and revelation. Only the Holy Spirit can reveal Jesus to us in our inner spirit. And he reveals Jesus to those who are hungering and thirsting after such revelation, who want to know the Lord in that way. He reveals himself to such people, those who hunger and thirst, those who diligently seek him. Likewise, he goes on to say in Luke 10.22, no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. We can think we know God as Father, but if we get anxious in a time of testing, then we have to say we don't know him as Father, because if you really knew him as Father, you wouldn't be anxious, you wouldn't be fearful. It's because you don't know him as Father in your spirit that fear and anxiety take a hold of your life. Fear concerning the future, perhaps. Fear concerning your family members. What we need is not an intellectual understanding that God is our Father, but spiritual revelation. The Lord Jesus revealing the Father to us. It says here, no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. And if you do know God as Father, don't boast about it. Because you didn't know that by your cleverness. Jesus was gracious to reveal the Father to you. Let's humble ourselves. And recognize that we have nothing which we did not receive. Everything we have received through grace. And then he turned to the disciples. And he said privately to them. Verse 23, Luke 10. Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. Do you know it's blessed? To be able to see spiritually these things. Spiritual revelation is the most blessed thing of all. Blessed are the eyes which see the things you see. The things that were happening in their generation. And which has come down to our generation in this Christian age. For I say to you, he says, that many prophets and kings wished to see the things which you see and did not see them, and to hear the things which you hear, and did not hear them. There are many prophets in the Old Testament time who longed to see the day of Christ, but they did not see it, and to hear this wonderful gospel, but they could not hear it. We don't appreciate what a wonderful privilege it is to know this gospel, that we can be conformed to the likeness of Christ, that our nature can be changed, our past life blotted out, that's only one part of the message, and that our inner life can be transformed so that we become Christ-like, so that the humility of Christ becomes ours in our inner being, the patience and the goodness and the love and the purity of Christ becomes ours in our inner being. This is the gospel, and it is ours. And then we read further in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus was constantly confronting people who were putting him to the test. And if we follow Jesus, we will also find Many, many people who seek to test us. And in all those situations, 
we can think of the wonderful promise that the Lord gave to his disciples, which is a promise for us too. He said to his disciples in Luke 21, 15, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your enemies or opponents will be able to resist or refute. There is a promise, Luke 21, 15, that we can claim that God will give us mouth and wisdom which none of our enemies will be able to refute or resist. It's the same wisdom that the Holy Spirit gave Jesus when people came to him like this, putting him the test, saying, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? There was a catch in it. But Jesus wasn't fooled, as you see in the subsequent parable that he spoke. He first of all asked him, he said, what's written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered and said, the law says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind, and your neighbors yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the man went on. He said, to justify himself, he said to Jesus, who's my neighbor? And there was a, a trick in the question. How can I love everybody in the world? And then Jesus went on to tell the parable of this good Samaritan.